So I get to start with a delicious irony for you. I have a problem. And the topic and title of my talk was printed incorrectly. So I just want to draw your attention to the real title, the problem with not having any problems. <laughs> One of the most important components of any talk is to know your audience. And out here we have a number of educators and administrators and a number of staff and really devoted volunteers. And you guys, you are, you're my tribe. I want you to know, however, that you're not actually the audience for whom this talk is intended. And you are the experts that are working out there in the trenches every day. And in all reality, I feel like I don't have anything that I can actually bring to you that you don't already know. So instead, I am hoping to speak through you to the parents of your students, to their families, and to the community members that are joining us here today. And all of these folks should be actively engaged in your success as educators. And therefore, in that engagement, they're engaged in the success of our kids. I've been really blessed in having a variety of professional experiences that have allowed me to see the whole spectrum for our students, from early childhood all the way up into the workplace. I started my career as a kindergarten teacher, and for the last eight years, I've been working and teaching in higher education. And there was a 15-year interruption in there when I ran and started multiple companies uh, and hired some wonderful people. Most importantly, though, I'm a mom, and I've raised my kids through our educational system and into adulthood. In my professional role today, one of uh, the most important aspects of that is to stay informed on the skills that are needed out there. And what I hear consistently from employers are that our graduates have a great knowledge of the fields that they're going into, and they may have good technical skills, but they have absolutely no ability to apply that knowledge and skills to real world problems. And that statement gets my attention. I am a firm believer that the key to our success is how we face and handle the very real problems that this world is going to throw at us. And I also believe that developing that skill set is not pretty. And I can say that after a number of years of what we will call personal research in this area. Um, I'm going to tell you a story. It is not my finest moment, but this story is a perfect illustration of a few things I want to elaborate on in a moment. So I'm putting myself out there, and I just want to ask you to be gentle. Before I begin, though, you need to know this one thing. When my youngest was about four, he brought to me a sliver in his hand that had a little bit of an infection around it, and I took him to the doctor. And for a $35 copay, I had a professional handle this because that was more than I was willing to get into. <laughs> so <laughs> that being said, a number of years ago, it's a typical work day for me, and I'm with a client, and I get a call from my father-in-law. He says, Stace, Matt's having some really bad abdominal pain, and we need to get this checked out. Can you meet us in the ER? So my husband has some health issues, and two weeks prior to this call, he'd had an organ reconstruction surgery in Seattle. And this, um, the abdominal pain thing was kind of normal life for us at this point, so I was not too worried about this until I arrived at the ER, and my sister-in-law, she's a surgical PA, and she comes out of the ER room, and she is pale, and she whispers to me, he just opened up like the movie Aliens from top to bottom. So what transpires over the next few hours sums up to this. The surgery was still successful. His organs are fine, but my husband's pretty sick, and he has an internal infection so bad that his body has created a way to try and get rid of it. He is transported to Seattle, and the professionals there cleanse and sterilize every inch and then they tell us these three fascinating facts. One, they can't sew them back up because the infection is just going to come back. And then uh, this whole thing that played out that day will just repeat itself. Two, they can't keep him in the hospital for the eight months or so that it's going to take for this to heal up. And three, this cleansing procedure needs to be repeated regularly. So they're going to teach me, you can see it coming, I can tell, <laughs> <laughs> that 
they're going to teach me how to do this, and then they're going to send us home in about a week where I will repeat this process three times a day for the next eight plus weeks. You already laughed. You know this is not going to go well. Every fiber in me is rebelling against this, and the doctors and the nurses start this training process, and I am standing over as far away in the hospital room as I can get, not looking, but nodding my head at all the appropriate times, and in between sessions, I'm calling every home health agency in the region to try and get someone else to come to my house and handle this. No one will touch it. The liability is too great. And so a week later, we're exactly where the doctor said we would be. We're at home. My husband's lying in a bed. And I'm standing next to him with a very carefully organized succession of medical supplies. I have to remove all the gauze and the dressing before I can go scrub up. So I do this and get a good look at what I'm dealing with for the very first time. And then I head around the end of the bed and towards the door. When I start having that experience that we saw as kids in the cartoons, things are going black. There are stars spinning around my head. And I go down right in the doorway. <laughs> it is OK to laugh at that. Right now, when you picture that, this is really funny. Uh, but back then, not so much. My husband, he cannot do anything. He didn't even say anything that I'm aware of. I have no idea how long I lay there. I'm not sure if I fully passed out or just mostly passed out. Um, eventually, I got up. I went and scrubbed up for about 20 minutes while I tried to pull myself together. And then I came back and dealt with it. It took forever. And when I was done, I was drenched in sweat. And I remember the feeling of relief that rolled over me. It is finished. And then immediately, a wave of realization hit me. In four hours, we're going to have to do this again. And then 700 plus more times after that. I'm very well aware that this story has probably made you feel extremely uncomfortable. And, or grossed out, or any other adjective you want to throw in here. Uh, so I want you to, to sit for a moment and allow yourself to feel that discomfort. Don't push it away like we usually do. While I ask you a few questions. If this had been you, and you were in my shoes, not my husband's, thankfully, but in mine, how many of you think you would have handled this like a boss? One hand, two hands? Thank you. That makes me feel so much better. Not very many of you. How many of you are willing to admit that you would have bolted and not touched it? <laughs> Excellent. Uh, how many of you have no idea what you would have done? Yeah, that's about right. Life deals us some very difficult problems sometimes. And every single one of us, we will have multiple moments where we have to decide how we're going to handle those problems. And the deciding part is easy. Handling it, that's where it gets hard. And those are the moments when we are actually building what turns out to be one of the most predictive skill sets for future success. Efficient and effective Resilient problem solving, if you will. It means it works, and it means you keep at it until it does work. So everybody take your right hand, and I want you to connect with your right brain for a moment. This is the audience participation <laughs> portion. So in here, you have an amygdala. And this is like the first responder on the scene when you are facing a problem. You can relax now. And most of us have typically one of three responses, fight, flight, or freeze. And in my story here, you saw them all. When I am calling the home health agencies, this is a version of flight. I have to get out of this. When I went down in the doorway, freeze, that is your brain's uh, extreme response to stressful stimuli. <laughs> and when it starts shutting down those systems without your permission, it's kind of creepy when you think about it. And finally, fight kicked in when I was able to come back and take care of this and when I fought through that for the next eight to nine months that it actually took us to deal with this issue. I'm remembering an awful lot at this moment. <laughs> Those were some pretty intense moments for us. Um, hey, baby, I've always had your back. If you've got mine, can you bring me my notes? Thank you. It's almost like I planned it, isn't it? She did <laughs> He survived. Thank you very much. 
crazy thing is I know exactly where I am on these pages. So we hit the right brain side, right? With the responses that you saw in my story, two of those are not true right brain responses in that you didn't see true fight. Some of you raised your hands and you said that this would have been you. When the doctors were doing that training, you would have been right there with your superhero cape on and would have handled this. You also did not see true flight. That would have happened back in the ER. There are a lot of spouses who would have left and not addressed this because it's just too much, right? I am very thankful that my right brain responses were actually tempered by my left brain. Everybody connect there for a moment, too. In here, you have another amygdala. And this one's smaller, unfortunately. And it is, more, it is responsible more for thought rather than action. And this is where our logical problem-solving processes happen. Both sides of the brain are critically important when you're facing a problem. But the real magic actually happens when you can train both halves to work together. And then you can practice that training over a variety of different problems and build a habit loop. And that habit loop will benefit you and everyone around you for the rest of your life, no matter what kind of problem you're facing. I had no such habit loop when I, for problem solving when I first started adulting. There had been no reason. My parents are soulmates. My uh, four, the four kids, we were all raised in the same home that my parents still live in today. And we all had an exceptional education. And I know for a fact that three out of four of us have said to my mom and dad, thank you so much for ensuring that we were 100% unprepared for the real world. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew that there was a real problem with not having any problems? And when you... Um, well, there's also no degree path that could have helped me uh, either. I wish higher ed would have addressed that. Uh, but you could not have predicted that I would need both the education degree and I would need a business degree, nor that I would need some kind of a medical degree, right? Um, I'd never taken a single business class before. And you, as you know now, we had some problems. So I had to jump into business because I had to take care of my family. And this, I learned some really big tests, uh, really big lessons through a number of big tests in that. And one of them turns out to be a really basic business principle. If you can solve a problem for someone, you have a potential business opportunity. And when you look around the world through this lens, you can see that every job and every position exists because it solves a problem for other people. From the wastewater engineer who is out there dealing with things all day that I don't want to even understand, uh, to the skincare company that is fixing my wrinkles. And in schools, we teach set curriculum so that our students can go out and then deliver those solutions. And as you heard earlier from some of our employers, our students are relatively well prepared for careers, but we're still missing something that's pretty important. Our world is changing faster than we can write curriculum to teach and train solutions. And we need more people who are out there and prepared to get in front of our potential problems to identify the tests that are coming at us and who can adapt and learn right in the middle of what we're facing. This is how life really works. We need more problem-based learning in every subject and every grade so that our kids are prepared to deal with the problems that are going to happen for them later on in life. Problem solving is the height of transferable skills. It transcends subjects and industries, professional lives and personal lives. It is the skill set by which we thrive or barely survive. Bringing additions like problem solving exercises into the classroom requires the effort and support of our entire community. We are already asking a lot of our teachers. They are under-resourced. They are over-legislated. How are we, as community members, parents, 
and families, bringing our best problem-solving skills to our teachers so that we can help them make the changes that they know they need and want to make in their classrooms for our kids? Are we asking them the right questions? Are we listening and responding to the things that they're asking for? There may be some really big changes that need our support, and there may be a number of really little things that we can help with. I have an illustration of a little thing for you. So when my son, my oldest, was five, he was two weeks into kindergarten, and I was trying to get him in the shower one morning, but he was unenthused. We'll just call it that. And my brain is registering the potential problem here. It has only been two weeks. We have 12 more years to go. This is gonna get, this is gonna get ugly, right? So I held his little shoulders and I gave him what I thought was a motivational speech. I said, hey honey, you need to learn everything you can, both in school and outside of school, so that someday you can choose what kind of company you wanna run. And that kid did this. Mom, when I grow up, I'm gonna be a dad. And only moms can run companies. <laughs> yeah. There are many reasons to love this story. Obviously, he was not listening to my lecture, uh, but he was watching my example. And there was one thing that I wish I had done that I think would have really improved and been really powerful in that example. I wish I had stopped asking my kids, what do you want to do when you grow up? Instead, I wish I had been asking them this. When you grow up, what kind of problems do you want to solve? I think that that statement has the power to strengthen the very foundation of why and how we educate our kids. I think we need to ask that question and then show our kids real problems. Real problems and then get out of their way a little bit. We need to be a resource when they ask for help. We need to support them by connecting them to information and people. We need to watch them struggle and not interfere. And we need to give them as many opportunities as possible to try the really hard stuff for themselves, connecting that right brain, the creative and emotional side, to the left brain, and that logical problem-solving side, and build that habit loop. We have no idea what kind of problems our kids are going to face in their life, and many are facing problems in their day-to-day -day right now. We do know, however, with certainty that there will be many problems in their future. I think that this question has the ability to shift their perspective in the direction that they need to grow into their future. And I also think that this question is very powerful to shift our perspective. I want our kids to know that they are becoming very important and skilled problem solvers and that they're gonna make our world just a little bit better with every test and problem that they tackle. When you grow up, what kind of problems do you want to solve?